welcome to Tuesday night in A&E at one o'clock in the morning. You've picked the right, you know, you've picked, you've picked the right slot basically because it's nice and quiet. You've picked the right open day. Um, so in, 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 in June, when everybody's thinking about their applications, we have this lecture theatre. We only let students into this lecture theatre. Um, and then we have the lecture theatre behind us, we have a live stream, and then we have seminar rooms with a live stream as well that we put the parents in. So it is brilliant. It's really nice actually to have an open day because obviously we're so close to the deadline. The rest of the university is really busy, um, but we've only got two weeks left before the medicine deadline. So for medicine and dentistry, we're having a really quiet, really relaxing day today. Um, and um, we, were, we were fine earlier on, but um, you've clearly picked the right session. So I will try and make it as quick as possible. Um, the, the format of the talk is that I'll talk to you for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, and um, so I'm Jerome, Head of Admissions for the Medical School. Um, and then what we'll do is we've got some of our amazing medical students uh, who will be coming into the talk in a few minutes' time. And um, they'll do a Q&A with you and I can do a Q&A with you. So we'll spend up to an hour, the first part of it, me talking at you. Um, ask you a few questions, tell you a bit about the structure of the program and tell you a little bit about the entry requirements and, and then we'll do a Q&A session with me and with the, uh, with the students themselves. So sit back and relax and let's talk you through the program. So we're a little bit different in terms of how we deliver medical education in Manchester. Um, so you might, if you go online and, and do some research, you'll, you'll no doubt come across this idea that you've got traditional medical programs and you've got PBL-based medical programs. Actually, in, in actual fact, they don't exist in the UK anymore. You can't really find a very traditional medical program that's purely lectures and purely practical classes. You know, even Oxford and Cambridge aren't really close to that. And you can't really find a, uh, a purist PBL program in the UK um, anymore. You know, you've got St. George's and you've got the Nottingham Graduate Program um, that, that really emphasise those types of learning. But um, in, yeah, to all intents and purposes, most medical schools are somewhere in the middle of that continuum between very, very traditional and... Um, and very problem-based. Manchester's no different, it sits in the middle, um, and, but we, we feel that we're re really quite interesting in, in terms of the way that we structure our curriculum. So I'm gonna talk through, just spend a few minutes talking through our educational strategy, the way that we deliver uh, the medical curriculum here in Manchester, and um, you know, how we teach, how you learn. So we're a mixed methods curriculum. And what that means is we use some really, really traditional teaching methods. Um, so we're one of a really small number of programs in the UK that use full body dissection to teach anatomy of human cadavers. So we do full body um, cadaveric dissection. Uh, in the medical school on the third floor, we've got a, a full anatomy suite. Um, but at the same time, we use um, case-based learning. So we use problem-based learning and team-based learning and case-based learning um, where you're in really small groups, about 12 students to one tutor, um, and you're working through a clinical case each week. In between, you've got lectures. So in year one, um, you have lectures. In year two, you have lectures each week. In years three, four, and five, you have teaching, small group teaching, large group teaching out at your hospital base as your clinical education campuses. You have online teaching in years three, four, and five. Um, as well. We've always been at the forefront of technology enhanced learning, um, so we were recognized by Apple a few years ago as being a center for excellence. Our third year students have iPads and they get their clinical skills, they get their placements signed off um, by uh, staff on placement using the iPads, so them carrying bits of paper around. So even pre-pandemic we used a lot of technology enhanced learning in years three, four and five. So we, we, we're really experienced with things like video lectures, with um, uh, with some online learning, simply because of the geography of Manchester. We have placements up in Preston, we have placements in Crewe, we have placements in central Manchester, we have placements all across the northwest, we have placements on the Isle of Man. Um, and it's not, and it, and it never has been feasible to get every fifth year student back to the Stopford building for a lecture when some of them are on the Isle of Man and some of them are in central Manchester and some are in Salford and some are in Preston and some are in Crewe. Um, so particularly in the later years of the programme, we've always had a really strong technology enhanced learning focus uh, in addition to obviously uh, everything that you're doing on placement. 
I'll tell you a little bit about the structure of the program in terms of clinical placements in a second, but one of the things that our students always say to us is that they feel very, very prepared for their first jobs as a junior doctor, and that's because of the structure of um, year five in particular of the program, um, where towards the end of, um, of, of the fifth year, you're shadowing junior doctors, you're doing a lot of the things that junior doctors do in the workplace, so that when it comes to that first job, you don't feel out of your depth. As a, newly qualified, as a newly qualified doctor. To let you do that, we get a lot of our exams and assessment out of the way quite early in year five. I'll talk about reflective practice, um, and I'll talk about clinical immersion in a second. Go back to mixed methods, so we've got lectures, we've got practical classes where we teach physiology and pharmacology and microbiology. We've got dissection, and we've got online and face-to-face -face lectures. We've got small group team-based and problem-based learning. We've got clinical skills, um, where we're teaching you in small groups. We've got, um, um, we've got statistics classes. We've got pretty much, you name it, we, we use that teaching method. So we're one of the largest medical schools, in fact, the largest medical school in the UK, who include all of our postgraduate clinical programs as well. Um, and so you'll be sat in a lecture theatre like this one. So I'm in a few weeks time, I'm teaching our second years in here. So you'll have lectures with a group of about 430 um, other, um, other students in year one and two. And then the next hour, you might be in a group of three in consultation skills, and then you might be in a group of 30 in a laboratory class, then you might be in a group of 12. Um, so we actually use the full range of big group teaching, small group teaching, um, in delivering our curriculum. And we think we have the balance absolutely right. We are in the middle of a bit of a transition. So um, we used to call it problem-based learning. Um, we're now moving to a slightly more structured version of that called team-based learning. Still focuses on seeing a patient case each week. Still fo focuses on following a patient through their journey um, in each week of the program. This is the Stopford Building. I'm sure some of you have seen it today already. Stopford Building is the spiritual home of the medical school. So it's where a lot of the staff are based. It was built in the early 1970s and we've outgrown its lecture theatres. So we do, we deliver lectures in places like this one instead, but all the small group teaching and the clinical skills uh, is taught in years one and two in the Stopford Building. A couple of, if you haven't been on the tour, so we've got the medical library here on the third floor, the textbooks are just off to the side of that photograph. We use lots of technology enhanced learning. So this, for example, is a SimMan. Uh, it's a really high fidelity simulator. We can program this guy or girl with um, a whole load of um, different, uh, different things. So it breathes, its chest rises and falls, and uh, we can take blood from it. Um, we can get interosseous access for it. Uh, we can um, examine it. We can even make them speak. Um, so quite realistic. We use a lot of technology enhanced learning in years one and two and year three to prepare you for the work that you do with patients. But we also, right from the start of the course, and I'll show you in a second the structure of the program, um, we have early clinical experience. So years one and two of the course are mainly spent here on campus, um, but we do have some taster placements. We call it early clinical experience. And you'll spend a few weeks in each year in hospital placements and in GP placements out in the community so that right from the start, you're meeting patients, you're talking to patients, and you're seeing what it's like to work in a clinical environment. In amongst that, we also get patients in for you to examine, for you to talk to, you take histories from, and we have simulated patients, actors, um, who are really good at honing your communication skills in years one and two of the course as well. So what does it look like? Uh, we start off in year one. You've all come from very, very different backgrounds. Some of you have done A-levels. Some of you um, have studied international baccalaureate. Some of you have come from all over the world, um, different education systems. Some of you are graduates uh, applying for the program. In fact, it's a really interesting time of year. So we were talking earlier on about it being a really quiet, open day for us because most people have decided. There's probably, in, in this audience, some of you will be writing your applications. You've sat your UCAT. Um, there's a few nods. Um, and you're, you're looking at different medical schools and you're thinking, actually, which of these medical schools should I apply to? You've narrowed it down to a list, and in two weeks' time, it's the UCAS deadline, and you're ready to press the submit button and, and actually apply to your medical schools. Others, you're quite early, and you're maybe doing your GCSEs or um, just thinking about starting sixth form, and you're wondering what subjects to pick, and uh, you're, you're, you're sort of playing a very long game, and you're thinking about it really, really uh, early on. 
Okay, so year one starts off with essential skills, and that's a very short block of a few weeks, and what that block is intended to do is get you used to working at university, because you learn in a completely different way um, in medical school as opposed to sixth form. And then, again, this shows how our curriculum is structured somewhat differently um, to a lot of other medical schools. We don't have blocks or modules or units in years one and, and, and two. So on some courses, you might have the neurology unit running alongside the endocrinology unit running alongside the respiratory unit. Um, so in any week, you might have lectures on the respiratory system, you might have lectures on the cardiovascular system, you might have lectures on the brain. Um, we don't do it like that. We divide the year into two semesters across year one and two. Um, the good thing is that you get normal student holidays, <laughs> Easter and Christmas and, uh, and the summer in years one and two. Um, you don't really get normal student holidays in years three, four and five, uh, particularly over the summer because you'll be on placement um, for a lot of that. But you do get to have some fun while you're at uh, medical school. The way that we structure semester one, so that runs from September through to just after Christmas for the assessments, um, is that each week you see a different patient, a virtual patient. Um, you follow that patient through their journey, right from initial presentation, right through to management and follow-up. So you start the week by opening a clinical case, and you say, okay, Mrs. Smith presents to a GP with chest pain. Um, and you think, well, actually, what do we know about the anatomy, the physiology of the cardiovascular system? What do we already understand from the learning that we've already done? And you come up with different differential diagnoses. So, okay, what's causing Mrs. Smith's chest pain? Any ideas? What could be a potential cause of Mrs. Smith's chest pain? Oh, what, sorry? Okay, so it could be something to do with the cardiovascular system. It could be not enough blood getting to our heart, something like, something like that, absolutely. Um, so it could be angina or a heart attack or something, or something like that. Yeah, am I? Anything else that could cause Mrs. Smith's chest pain? Stress. Stress. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, some sort of something respiratory going off there, maybe. Maybe she's just got dyspepsia. Maybe she's just got a bit of indigestion. Um, maybe she's pulled a muscle. Um, so you come up with different differential diagnoses. And throughout the session, you'll use your knowledge. Your tutor will guide you. Um, and you'll say, well, what do we need to understand this week? We need to know a bit more about the anatomy of the heart. We need to know a bit more about the cardiac conducting system. We might want to know a bit more about the structure of blood vessels. Um, and then you follow that patient through their journey. So what was said to them? What history was taken from them? Um, what examinations were performed? What tests and investigations were performed? What was that patient prescribed? How were they managed? Um, and then we get them to follow up as well. Um, so we see how that patient's doing in a few months, in a few months' time. And across the course of the week, you'll be going to practical classes where, for example, you might be learning to record an ECG from a patient to look at the electrical activity in the heart. You have lectures, so that might be anatomy, that might be pharmacology, where you're learning about the drugs that you use in patients with cardiovascular disease. Um, it might be something in a laboratory uh, where you're looking at microscope slides of um, heart muscle, that kind of thing. Um, and obviously in the dissecting room where you're dissecting a cadaver and you're dissecting the uh, heart itself. And then we go on to the next week and we do loosely group the cases in blocks. So you'll have a series of cardiovascular cases and a sort of series of respiratory cases. Um, but we, we, we focus each week on a core pathology and the body systems um, that, that follow from that. So life cycle covers reproduction, it covers child development, it covers... Um, uh, senescence, end-of-life care, palliative medicine um, as well. Cardiorespiratory fitness, uh, fitness is semester two, so that's after Christmas in year one, and that covers the respiratory system, so things like COPD, asthma, COVID, dare we say it, um, in um, cardiorespiratory fitness, um, heart attack, MI, obviously, um, rest of the cardiovascular, kind of cardiovascular system. Um, and then we have our early clinical experience placement, so you actually go out into GP practices and you go out into hospitals to see how, what it's like in practice. In year two, we start with mind and movement, which is a semester that focuses, as the name suggests, on things like... Um, the um, dementias, so you'll study Alzheimer's disease, movement disorders, you'll study things like Parkinson's disease, um, you'll look at psychosis, you'll look at depression, um, and then we'll move into nutrition and metabolism, 
um, and uh, there are about sort of 12-ish cases in each of these um, in each of these each semesters that are core cases. Nutrition and metabolism looks at the stomach, looks at the intestines, looks at the mouth. Um, so we do things like stomach ulcer, gastric ulcer. Um, we will look at the liver. We'll start uh, studying endocrinology. Uh, we'll look at the renal system uh, as well. And um, we'll look at say for things like um, benign um, prostatic hyperplasia. You know, we'll look at we'll look at the urinary system. More early clinical experience, and then we go into year three. Year three structure. So from year three of the course, you're based at a hospital campus. You're based at a clinical education campus. And that is one of our hospital sites across the region. We've got Preston up in the north. We've got Salford, in the city of Salford. Um, we've got Manchester Foundation Trust, our University Foundation Trust. Um, one of the hospitals is just down the road. It's the MRI. Um, and the other one is Withenshaw. So you're assigned to one of those hospital bases and you rotate out to district general hospitals and to community placements, mental health placements, GP placements from that mini medical school site. And that's because we've got such a huge and really spread out geography across the, uh, across the Northwest. So it's the general medical and surgical placements, it's respiratory, it's cardiology, it's endocrinology, that sort of stuff. As we go into year four, um, you've got more specialty medical placements. So dermatology, neurology, uh, going into, into those specialty areas. And the same with the uh, surgical placements as well. You've also got the opportunity in year four to take part in an elective. Um, the elective's your opportunity to do something different. It lasts about a month in year four. Um, and some students use it as the opportunity to travel around the world. So you might want to see um, what healthcare is like uh, in a different part of the uh, different part of the world, and use it as a as a chance to travel. I had a student who did a research elective in Wigan, so you don't always have to travel around the world. You know, it can be uh, it can be something local, it can be something research focused, it can be something um, educational. And there are also student selected components as well. So you've got the chance to modify the program a little bit to focus on things that you're interested in. So I mentioned dermatology, for example. If you're a budding dermatologist, you might say, Do you know what? I've had a little bit of a taster of that, but I want to do a little bit, I want to spend a little bit more time in dermatology, neurology, urology, pick any old specialty and you can spend a little bit more time there um, if you want to. Year five is preparation for practice, as I said, we get the assessments out of the way quite early in, um, in year five and then for the latter part of year five you're shadowing a junior doctor so that things aren't new to you, obviously you can't do the statutory stuff, you can't prescribe or anything like that at that point but you can follow them through um, and you can get used to what it's like to work as a junior doctor. Running alongside the whole of the curriculum, we've got two other things. We've got personal and professional development, um, which is where you keep, so doctors keep portfolios um, of, their, uh, of their work. You'll be reflecting, you'll be writing reflective accounts of the patients that you've seen, the things that you've done, and um, you'll be collecting that together in an electronic portfolio that's good for your career development and CV writing and things like that. There's also something called PEP, which is the Personal Excellence Path. So we're quite an academic program. Um, we're a very strong academic medical school. So um, the PEP is your opportunity to engage with research in each of these three years. Uh, so in year one, you do a group project and you read the literature. You look at the scientific and medical literature. Um, you pick a supervisor. You carry out a literature project and you create a poster as if you were going to a scientific or a medical conference. So it gets you, eases you into your research skills. In year two, you do another literature project with a supervisor and you write up a dissertation. So you do a bit of extended writing um, in addition to your other assessments. Then into year three, you're ready to do your own research, so you carry out your own research project. Um, some of those might be literature projects and reviews, others might be educational projects, um, others are laboratory-based research projects, and others are, for example, clinical audit and doing work um, on, on audit out in, um, in placement. In year four and year five, you're still doing that, uh, but it takes on more of a what we call quality and evidence feel. It's increasingly focused on improving outcomes for patients um, and doing things like audits uh, out in your placement. Year three, four, and five, um, we're not saying that you can't have fun 
uh, in years three, four, and five. Students engage, you know, students um, join loads of societies, sports societies, medsoc, all the sorts of usual things that you would do as a student enjoying themselves in year one and, uh, and year two of the course. In year three, four, and five, medical students still have a really active social life. But as we get into year three, and particularly into year four and year five, um, the medical program becomes more like having a job, more like being on placement full time as a um, almost working at a sort of full working week, really. You'll do some on calls and things as well. So you'll have some, you, you'll see different types of medicine. You know, you do one on call, very occasion. It's not, you're not doing on calls each week and you're not doing evenings each week, um, but it's good to get a taster of what's happening at different times of day. Uh, and different specialties. Right, so that's enough about the program. Feel free to ask about that in a second. Um, a lot of you will have questions about how we select students. Um, so aptitude testing, we use the UCAT. If you haven't already sat the UCAT, have a look at that online. Do the practice tests under timed conditions. Um, we operate a threshold-based admission system that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and in terms of our UCAT thresholds, you can find them all on our website. Um, so if you just search for Manchester Medicine Data, um, you'll see the historic UCAT thresholds. Um, so for example, last year uh, we cut off at 2,730 as, um, as our UCAT threshold. Do expect that to change a little bit this year. Um, last year was really quite high. Um, and um, we accept anyone with a band one, two or three um, in the situational judgment test. We don't accept applications from people with a band four. Um, and we do prioritize band one and band two um, when selecting students. I get asked lots of questions about work experience and what should I do for my work experience. People are always really worried about whether their work experience is appropriate um, and they're worried about whether they've done enough. Um, what I will say is that for most medical schools, the pandemic's caused a major shift in, um, in work experience. We were always very relaxed about it. Um, why do we ask you for work experience? Shout out an answer. Yeah, we want we want you to to have some understanding of what it's like to be a like to be a doctor. Any other things? Say again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can you can demonstrate some of the skills and the values and and, and attributes required to be a to be a good medical student and a good doctor. Yep, absolutely excellent. Um, that's good. We've always required caring work experience of some description. So pre pre pandemic, um, we used to like to see things like people working in care homes, people volunteering with vulnerable adults and vulnerable older people. Um, shadowing experience is, is great, but we're aware that not everybody can get. You know, if you know a doctor or a dentist or another healthcare professional, it's quite easy um, to uh, to get that work experience. If you don't, then it can be more difficult. And a lot of hospitals and GP practices suspended their work experience. Um, programs when we entered the pandemic and they're not all back up and running yet. Um, so you can do online work experience as well. So a lot of the Royal Colleges offer online work experience um, programs. So the RCGP or the Royal College of General Practitioners is one that has a really good program. Some of the others do. Coming along to open days, taking part in taster activities, that all counts as well. Um, so try not to worry too much about work experience. It is less of a major component of the selection process than it, than it used to be. Academic entry requirements next. So AAA at A level, so our standard offer is AAA, um, and we normally require seven GCSEs at grade seven, and that's an A or an A star if you sat your uh, GCSEs a number of years ago. Um, we do require a six in English language and maths. If you sat the International Baccalaureate, it's 37.766 at higher level. Obviously, we need to sit the UCAT as well. Um, if you've attended a school or a college, that has GCSE and A-level results below the national average, um, or if you come from a postcode that doesn't send many people to higher education, um, then you can check on the university website if you're eligible for what's called a contextual offer um, that can reduce the requirements. So instead of being AAA, it can be a little bit lower, and instead of seven GCSEs, it can be six GCSEs. Um, so we do adjust our entry requirements if you're eligible for a contextual uh, offer. Great. Uh, come in, ladies and gents. Thanks. Um, so now we get asked lots of questions about personal statements. The short answer is we don't read them. 
uh, that causes like lots of gasps from the audience. Um, most medical schools these days don't read the personal statement. Uh, there are a few medical schools that still do read the personal statement, so please obviously write one if, you, um, if you're just applying to universities like Manchester, you can leave the personal statement box blank. We don't look at it at all. Um, <clears throat> so what we do do is once you've applied, we send you a non-academic information form. Um, so we send you a separate form to fill in, which is basically a structured personal statement. So if you're sat there in the audience thinking, oh no, I've wasted loads of time writing a personal statement. You haven't. Um, what you can do is you can cut and paste bits of that personal statement into the non-academic information form. That's fine. Uh, but it gives you more space to write about why you want to come to Manchester. And obviously you'll be applying to up to four medical schools. Um, so you'll be able to tailor it to those medical schools. You know, If on your personal statement you write, well, I want to come to Manchester, um, and then Gordon at Keel or whatever, um, or Claire at Newcastle, my counterparts, read it. And they're like, well, they say they want to go to Manchester. <laughs> well, I'll come here then. Um, so we, we send you a structured personal statement um, called non-academic information form. And these are the things that it focuses on. So motivation, work experience, either online or in person, or a combination of both. Um, team working, give us an example of a time that you've worked in a team and tell us about it, reflect on that. Um, and hobbies and interests. Why do we want to know about your hobbies and interests? Yeah, so medicine's a really long, difficult course. Um, we're looking to see that you've got a good work-life balance. Yeah, absolutely. Any other reasons? I mean, we're nosy. It could be one. Yeah, we're quite nosy, and we want to know what we want to know what you do. Any other ideas? Some people sometimes say things like transferable skills. You might pick up lots of transferable skills in, in your hobbies and interests that help you um, in, your academic, in your academic studies. All absolutely valid. Take a step back from things like motivation, team working, work experience. And imagine that you're in your interview. And your interviewers will be some of our medical students do interviews for us. Um, academic staff like myself. Uh, people who are working in clinical practice, so doctors of various different uh, grades, um, other healthcare professionals, members of the public that interview for us. The thing that's in the back of their mind, um, actually, I'm not planning on retiring before you qualify. Um, I'm not quite that old yet. Um, and some of my colleagues aren't either. Um, so they'll be working with you. They will be, they, you will be their colleagues when you graduate as a, as a, as a new medical graduate. So one of the things that's always in the back of their minds as an interviewer are obviously all of that stuff around hobbies, interests, work-life balance. But they're thinking, is this a normal, fully functional human being in front of me that I can have a conversation with? Are they going to be a good colleague in the future? That's what's always in the back of their mind. You know, An interview for medical school is almost an interview for a job. Very few people drop out between the start of medical school and the end of medical school. The vast, vast majority of the people that we have on day one of the course become doctors at the end of the course. The dropout rate is very, very, very small. Um, so we're, we're basically interviewing for a profession as well as um, interviewing for entrance to university. So treat it as a job interview as well. We get asked lots of questions about hobbies and interests. It doesn't matter. Do whatever interests you. I had a guy a couple of years ago that was really worried because he played lots of online computer games and he was really competitive. Um, and he was like, oh, can I put it on my form? I'm like, yes, of course you can. Uh, it doesn't matter. We suggested that he went outside and did something in the real world as well, but um, always gets a laugh, that one. Um, but um, you know, whatever is right for you, um, you don't get 10 points for playing the violin and nine points for captaining the rugby team. You know, it's not 1970 anymore, and I don't think that ever happened in 1970, to be fair. Um, but uh, you know, say, say what is important to you, what makes you tick as a person, whatever those hobbies and interests are. Same goes with motivation. With some of you, it would be very cliche. You know, Your grandma might have been ill when you were young and you saw the doctors and the nurses and the other healthcare professionals look after that relative and you thought, I want to do that in the future. Or it might be that you just did A-level biology and chemistry and you thought, actually, I like science and I also like people, so this looks like a good profession. Um, either of those is fine. Um, it should be your genuine motivation. And that should carry through to, um, to interview as well. 
um, you know, at an interview, we're interested in finding out about you as, as an individual and what makes you tick. So this is our selection process. Applied by the 15th of October, which is obviously in two weeks time, um, the first thing that we do is we have a threshold-based system. Um, so you apply, we get the information from UCAS a few days after um, the uh, end of the, the, the closure date for applications on the 15th, and the team that you probably talk to in the, in the uh, atrium, um, the, the, the ladies in the admissions team, do an academic sift. Um, so what that means is they check that you meet the GCSE requirements, they check that you've predicted the right grades. Um, and they, they check that you've, that you've got the right qualifications or are sitting the right qualifications. If that's the case, then you move on to the next step, which is a UCAT screen. Um, so we look at your UCAT score. We aim to interview about 1,400, 1,500 people next year. Um, so, and we get, you know, last year we had just short of 3,500 applications. Um, so we need to take 3,500 down to 1,500. And one of the best ways of doing that is to rank the students and uh, the applicants in terms of your UCAT score. Um, so we'll prioritize people in band one and two of the situational judgment test, uh, and we'll rank people based on their UCAT score. We use your total score. We're not really bothered about the individual component, um, individual component scores on, on the UCAT. And then, like I say, on our website, uh, you can search, if you just Google Manchester Medicine Data, you can see all of the historic UCAT thresholds for the last five years, I think, um, on, um, on there. Last year was very high, so our cutoff last year was about 2,730 um, for, the, for the standard cohort. We do, if you're eligible for a contextual offer, we do have slightly lower thresholds for people that are flagged up as widening participation. Um, we also have, for 2023, we're changing it for 2024, so it won't be quite the same for 2024, but for 2023 entry, we also have a holistic assessment. So if our cut score was 2,730, if you fell just slightly short of that cut score, what we would do is we would have a look at your GCSE grades, we'd also have a look at your A-levels, and we'd have a look at your application in a bit more detail. And the reason we do that is just to make sure we're not missing any good candidates who fall just a few points short of the, uh, of the cut score. Um, then we invite people to interview. Um, you do your interview, and I'll talk about interviews on the next couple of slides. And then, so our interviews, we're planning this year um, to uh, give applicants the choice. We're not quite there in terms of uh, organizing it just yet, but we're planning to give you the choice of um, applying and being interviewed either in person or being interviewed online. Um, it's a five station, multiple mini interview, whatever you decide to do. We'll be interviewing from December through to the end of February, and then we'll make offers. Um, we sometimes make offers in batches as we go, uh, but we aim to have most of our offers out by March. So what happens at interview? We've got a couple of uh, couple of minutes to, um, to go. Um, so it's a five-stage MMI, so there are five stations. And the stations tackle things like this. So we're testing your raw communication skills. Um, we'll do some role play, so there'll be a station or two where you're in a role. It might be you as yourself. It might be you pretending to be a medical student. Um, we're not looking for amateur dramatics or anything like that. So you, know, you don't have to be a wonderful actor. Um, we're just gauging your raw communication skills. Um, we will give you some critical thinking and some problem solving. We won't set you any maths tests, numeracy, numeracy tests or anything like that. Some medical schools might. Um, we don't do that. Um, we were talking actually with the students earlier on about different problem solving tests. So a few years ago we used, I'll just give you a couple of examples of an interview station. Um, so the problem solving task was, you imagine you're a medical student and you're working in a care home. Um, and your task is to plan a day trip to the seaside for 30 older residents of the care home. Off you go. And then you would tell us how you would work through that scenario. So that's what we mean by problem solving. Um, we also look at your non-academic information form. So one of the interviewers will have a copy of the form that you submitted, and they'll ask you some questions about your work experience and your motivation and your team working. Um, we'll also set you a contemporaneous topic um, so, looking out for medicine in the news, um, we're fed up with COVID, um, so I'm not setting any more COVID questions. Uh, we had a question the other year um, where we said, how would you respond, if you were in, if you were in government, how would you respond um, to a pandemic similar to the, um, 
um, to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that would be another problem-solving type thing, and you would say exactly what you would do, whether you would do the same, whether you would do something differently. Um, without getting too deep into the politics, that created a range of different views in that, in that station. Um, and um, students often worry about those stations where you've got a slightly controversial topic. Uh, you know, you're trying to work out the political opinions of your interviewer. You don't have to do that. Um, because what we're looking for in these sorts of interview stations is we want you to be able to balance. Um, we want you to say, OK, these are the arguments in favour. Uh, in the case of the COVID one, it might have been something like COVID restrictions and lockdowns and face masks and things like that. Compulsory vaccination was another one that we used. Should we force people to be vaccinated? Um, and there are some, you know, there are, there are some people that would say, no, it's entirely free choice of the individual. There are other people that would drag people kicking and screaming to a vaccination centre. And, you know, most people converge somewhere in the middle. But you need to be able to understand the viewpoints at the extremes and come up, and come up with a balanced, a balanced opinion of your own. That's what I'm saying. So you can have whatever opinion you like but you just need to be able to show and demonstrate balance. And that applies to any of the stations that we ask, any of the um, hypothetical scenarios that we, that we give you. We're always looking for you to find the pros and cons um, of an argument and then to come up with your own opinion. And it's fine to have your own opinion. Great. Right, that is enough of me talking to you. So I'll get our students to introduce themselves. I will grab a microphone. And because we've got quite a small audience this time, it should be... You can, you can grill us. You can ask me admissions questions um, or any questions, and you can ask our students um, some questions about their experiences, about what it's like to be a medical student, what it's like to intercalate, anything that you, anything that you like. So I'll just get them to introduce themselves, think of some questions, and I'll come around with a microphone. Hi, everyone. So I'm Nadine. Um, it's going to be my eighth year of university, so I started off with a foundation of first year biomed. Um, and then I transferred onto the medicine course, which was a scheme at the time that we had, um, and completed three years in medicine before going into a PhD in intercalation. So it's an MD PhD in cancer, um, and it's my third year of that. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Helen. Um, I'm currently in fifth year. I did an intercalated MSc uh, after my third year. Hi, I'm Samuzi. I'm in my second year. Better than last time. You said I'm only a second year last time. <laughs> so, that's good. That's good. Good stuff. So we've got people from all over the program. We've got Nadine, who's basically a perpetual academic, who, you know, at some point will be professor of medicine um, <laughs> through to um, somebody in second year. Brilliant. Um, right. What questions do you have for me and for our students? Stick up your hand if you've got one. There we go. How is the non-academic uh, information form used in the application process? Okay, um, in the application process, we don't look at it until interview. Um, so we don't look at it until interview, and then um, it's your responses based on that form that get assessed in the interview. So it's really there as a prompt for the interviewer to, to, to look at. The form itself isn't scored, but it's what you enter into a discussion. So the interviewer reads it before the interview. And then they know they you know jot down some questions to ask you to ask you about it. That's how we do it. Great. Anything else? Uh, there and that. Right. Um, this is for the students. Why did you decide to do medicine at Manchester? Um, well, for me, it was like because Manchester is very hands-on, very interactive with the way they teach. So you're talking to patients pretty much from first year whether they simulate it or like when you go on your EC visits. And yeah, full body dissections means it's just a lot more you're learning whilst like trying to be a doctor, which I find like, which I found really interesting. Um, number one for me is they gave me an offer. So that was a good start. Uh, second, I think weirdly I liked my interview at Manchester. Um, it was a lot friendlier than some of the other interviews I had. Uh, I also like the fact they actually use students in the interviews as well, because you kind of had a feel for how they thought about it as well. Um, and then as time's gone on, whilst I've been at uni, I've actually grown to appreciate sort of the pastoral support as well, um, particularly third to fifth year. So because you're based out in a hospital, they have their own pastoral support teams there, the university do, the med school. So it doesn't mean you're sort of coming to and from uni if you have any issues, there's still always someone there that can, that can help. So I think the academic answer to why Manchester, um, it's a, 
very well known university for a start. I think it's one of the biggest in the UK, hopefully if I'm correct, Drew. Um, but it's, those things do um, come into play. But I think mainly with Manchester is it's very reflective of the environment you'll be working in. So the teaching and the learning styles are reflective to that of when you're actually practicing as a doctor. And that uh, transition is, um, from what I hear with the fifth years, etc. they find it quite a good process in actually transitioning into becoming a doctor. Um, it's very hands-on, you get early clinical experience from year one onwards, uh, which is exciting because you start to see yourself grow into becoming the doctor that you want to be. Um, but the non-academic um, answer to that would be also how many societies, the networking that you can get involved in. There's medical and non-medical societies within the university. I recommend both because you aren't just a doctor. There may, there's other things to you as there are with your hobbies. And having that balance um, within medicine and away from it as well is very important. Um, so and there's a lot to play and you're in the city pretty much, which is always good. You can go shopping, <laughs> but yeah. Great, uh, one more question here. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is about the personal statement. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, during the whole process, personal statement is not considered by University of Manchester. Whereas part of the interview process, do you look at it in that MMI process and five interviews, or is just non-academic form that you look at for the process of yeah. interview? Yeah, um, so we just look at the non-academic form. We don't ever read the personal statement. And about the experience, so is this the, just because of the pandemic of the last two years, the experience is not considered uh, because somebody's coming with a very less uh, experience or very few weeks experience because they couldn't get it. How will this actually impact the whole process? Yeah, okay, um, so we, um, as long as you have enough experience to understand what it's like to be a medical student and what it's like to be a doctor, um, that's fine. Um, if we go back 10 years ago, there were, there were medical schools that would score your work experience in terms of number of hours and where you did it and what you did. Um, we moved away from that a long time ago, actually. And, and I think the pandemic's just been the, um, the, the sort of final straw for the old work experience criteria. Um, so as long as you've done some work experience, whether that's online, face-to-face, -face, or a combination of both, and as long as you can reflect on that, it just forms part of an interview station. Um, so it's part of one interview station where they're asking you about your work experience, your motivation, your hobbies, and your interests. So it just forms part of that. We don't actually assess your work experience at any other point in the application, in the application process. Um, um, one of the reasons that we've really stuck with that is um, because it's, it's not fair to people who don't know doctors um, and who can't get on to a work experience program. You know, if actually, if mum or dad's a doctor, then it's really easy to go and <laughs> shadow them. <laughs> um, and, you know, my colleagues have done it and everyone's, you know, everyone's kind of done it. Um, whereas um, if, you, if you don't know any healthcare professionals, it can be really difficult to get that experience. You know, obviously, um, as much experience as you can get is, is, is great in any, in any format. But yeah, we don't score it specifically. Hope that answers it. Brilliant. Anything else? Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll come around there. When it comes to, you know, the intellectual offer, how low would you do you, your UCAT score? Like, how low would you drop it? Um, your UCAT, UCAT score. If you have a look on our website, um, it's got the WP um, threshold published on there. Off the top of my head, I can't remember what last year's was, um, but uh, it's all on there on the... It does drop quite significantly, actually. If you're a WP plus um, applicant, um, it does actually drop quite a, quite, quite a bit, actually. We are changing what we do for, um, for next year, so for 2024, got you. Um, for 2024, we are changing how we look at UCAT, um, and, um, and, and we're, we're, we're likely to, to not take people in band three of the SJT from, um, um, from, uh, from 2024, but in, in 2023, it can still apply. Yeah. I just wanted to ask the students how they found all the um, independent study and if they felt like they got enough support from lecturers and professors. Lecturers, professors, <laughs> clinicians, <laughs> call, call us what you like, fire away. Um, so you still have lectures, like you still have that baseline, you know, supportive environment where you are, I'd say spoon for the information, but given the information that you need for the baseline knowledge. 
I think what the programme does is it teaches you how to learn independently. And by that, it's not like you're left all alone and you, do, you, know, you have to start from nowhere. Through your um, problem-based learning discussion on the Monday, you'd have already covered what aspects you need to go and look into. And then what you tend to find is if you review like the titles of the, the week, and if you realise that they're not going to cover this certain aspect, then you know to go away and to go and research that. What you tend to find is resources-wise, I think there's loads on OneMed Learn usually, or if not, then generally speaking, you start to learn, know which websites, like the NHS website or you know, particular websites to look at uh, to research further. Um, but it's generally through, word of, I think, word of mouth, or just generally looking online and doing the Google search. Um, but you'll, you will find the resources, I guess, that are the staples that you'll end up using yourself. It is personal preference, to be honest. Uh, the other thing is if you do have lectures, the lectures change quite a bit because obviously we cover the whole of medicine, which is quite a broad topic. Um, but most of the lecture slides are always online first. They're also always available before the lecture as well, so it's useful to just kind of flick through them first. And the lecturer's emails are normally on the front of the slides as well, so if you do have any questions about something specific, you can always email them. Um, that's what I found useful. I think just like it is a step up from high school and like from sixth form or college or wherever because yeah your time is essentially your own but the lecture the lecturers are really supportive they do reply to emails and like they do give you resources and like I'd like give you like, options or that you could read this and this and this and it'll help you in that way but yeah I think another thing that I'd probably add to that is um you'll never know everything and there's a bit of a shift from, <laughs> there's a bit of a shift from A level, or even if you've done a degree before, if you've done a degree in another subject before where you had, you know, you had a curriculum, you had a syllabus, if you learnt the syllabus, you, um, you, you got there. And I was, I had some panicking first years the, the other day who were thinking, oh, now how do we go through all of this stuff? And it's not possible to learn all of medicine. Um, so uh, part of, as you go through the programme, um, being comfortable with what you don't know is actually really important. And obviously, you need to know enough to pass. And you, you know, you, again, if you if you've got academic interests and and research interests, then you know you might strive for excellence. You might be one of those people who goes after honours or whatever. But um, you know, you, you you need to, you need enough to be clinically competent. I was going to say, cause I'm in the final year at the moment. Um, I feel like I don't know anything <laughs> at some points. And then you bump into a first year on their first placement, and you realise how much you know. So it's not really until, one thing I did find, first and second year, because there is so much, you don't feel like you know everything. You go into third year and put it into practice and you suddenly realise how much you actually do know as well. But I guess one thing is, you will know what level you're at based on how PBL works, because by the Friday, so you've gone through all the week and you've learned the content independently and within the lectures, on the Friday, you'll all discuss what you've learned and you may have picked up on that you've missed something or you've not necessarily been able to teach something in as much depth as what you thought you knew. So it's a good cross-track between how much you know or how much you've got left to learn on that topic before you feel as though you've covered it enough through a week-to-week -week basis through PBL. So I think that's a good part of it, to be honest. And it's all about finding the level of detail you need to go into as yeah. well. So if I've given a lecture... Um, you know, giving a lecture to over 400 students, usually most of them are absolutely fine. Um, and maybe two or three students will, I mean, my office is right next to the entrance to the medical school, so they often just pop in. Um, but um, yeah, sometimes, you know, you'll get a few emails or you'll get a few people asking you questions. But most of the time, students sail through the programme with no problems, really. Anyway, that's a good discussion of that one. I've got another question here. Yes, hi. Thank you very much. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, the first to do with clinical placements in years three, four, and five. Yeah. Uh, being a resident of Manchester, um, should we be successful, would we be able to specify um, a hospital near our location? No, okay. it's randomly assigned. Um, it's a, your, your, your clinical placement base in year threes is assigned randomly. If students have really serious mitigating circumstances, so caring commitments or that kind of stuff, then then that's sometimes possible. But yeah, it is a random it is a random assignment. Students can express a so, uh, one about the, the, the geographically furthest placement is Preston, um, so students can express a preference for Preston, and we find a lot of local students want to go to Preston if they live in that part of Manchester. Otherwise, it's a random allocation. Okay, understood. And the second question being, and just future planning. Should you have an offer 
of say three A's, which is the standard offer, and you miss the offer by one grade, you get A, A, B in that yeah. particular year, then would the medical school obviously requ requires you to resit, but would you require a resit of all three A levels again in the say, in the say year 14 for argument's sake, or would it just be the one A level which is just the one that you've not met the grade in? Um, for for, for research, it's normally just the one that you've not met the grade in. Normally, we'll require an A star in the subject that you've resat um, if you've if you've if you've dropped a dropped a grade. Occasionally, and because medical schools are making fewer offers, um, because we've we've seen a bit of A level grade inflation, um, and we're seeing A level grade. Um, sort of profiles drop back down to pre-pandemic levels over the next couple of years. We will find that we're making more offers. Um, if we go back to 2019, um, our offer making strategy was that about a third of offer holders didn't meet the conditions of their offer. So about two thirds did meet the conditions of their offer um, and about a third didn't. Um, so we would make a third more offers than we needed to make. Um, and then on A-level results day, we would reject down the ones that that, that didn't meet the conditions of their offer. Um, some other medical school, because we're, we're quite high performing, quite academic medical school, um, so Manchester, Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, Kings, um, sort of have that offer making strategy. Um, some other medical schools had an offer making strategy where they would aim to top up. So they would, they would aim to come in slightly under um, and then they would accept a few people with near miss grades. Um, and they would t top up, say, maybe 10, 15 students uh, with two A's and a B, for example, um, and they would, they would accept those. Because um, we're, what, we're high, a high-tariff institution is the technical term, but um, we didn't do that. Um, but actually, all medical schools have now switched to that because of the constraints on offer-making that the government imposed last year. Um, so most medical schools for the next couple of years will probably be taking a small number of people who miss one grade. Um, so it, last year we took about 30 students actually who, who, just, who just dropped a grade um, out of, you know, out, out of 397. Um, most students actually exceed their offer. Um, but um, yeah, we will probably for the next couple of years be taking a small number of people that, that don't, quite, don't quite get it. Can Great. Can you include if it's like say two A stars and a B? Uh, yeah. Is that, is that, you know, exceeding in two? And missing in one, um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. We we don't use UCAS points or anything like that. But if you got two A stars and a B, um, we would try and fit you in. Um, we can't. From, it all depends on what happens on A level results day. Um, so on on A level results day, with teacher assess grades and centre assess grades, we did reject people with actually three A stars and a B. Um, if the B was in one of the required subjects, because we were just so we we have a, a cap on the student numbers. So the government regulates the number of medical training places in the UK. Manchester has 397 spaces. Um, we were allowed to exceed that during the pandemic because of it, problems with teacher assess grades and centre assess grades. Um, but we've all all medical schools have now. Uh, had to go back to the cap, so there are no new places in the system. Um, so it may be that things get tight again at some point in the future. But we would, you know, we we would rather. I mean, we've never been in clearing. Some of the medical schools have, but you know, we'd rather take you than go back out to advert. And you know, we know you've been through the whole process. You've accepted Manchester. We know you want to come here. We want to have you. We've interviewed you, we're really happy. And if you end up with two A stars and a B on results day, we'll try our best to squeeze you in. If it, if it ends up being very tight, um, then yes, we would. So say we've got two places and five students and they've all got the same A-level grades and they've all got basically the same GCSEs, we'd look at, we'd look at UCAT and, and, filter on, and filter on UCAT. Yeah, really good questions actually. Yeah, get three of you. <laughs> Great. Um, you said that with the UCAT, uh, bands one and two are prioritised. Are yeah. they prioritised equally, or is band one prioritised um, equally? Band one and two prioritised equally, yeah. Most people get a band one or a band two. Most people do quite well. Uh, gentlemen, they just shout out, I know. As long as they are a requirement, um, if, you are, if you're applying with predicted grades, we do need to see those GCSEs. 
Um, if you're applying with achieved A-level grades, the only thing we look at are your maths and your English, as long as, you've got, um, as, as long as you've got the requirements in maths and English. So if you're applying to us and you've already got your A-levels at the point of application, um, then we're not interested in your GCSEs apart from the maths and the English. Um, and the, the, way that we set, well, the reason we set those GCSE requirements is um, basically because we, we know that GCSE performance predicts A-level performance. So we want people, if, if you start dropping below that level, then inevitably the applicant doesn't meet their, their, the conditions. Um, we do let people resit in the year of application as well. So if, you've, if you're like one grade down, um, you can still apply and you can resit that GCSE in the year of application. If it's any more complex than that, drop us an email and we'll, we'll look at it individually. And is, is the GCSE taken on an average or is it just... No, it's, you need to have... You need to have seven. Yeah, yeah. Great, there was a question here, yeah. Yeah, so Nadine mentioned doing biomed, a year of biomed and transferring over to medicine. Do you do have any other schemes like that presently? Not at the moment, no. Um, so we used to offer a biomed transfer scheme. There are a couple of universities that do, um, but um, we, don't, we don't operate that one at the moment. Great. I think that pretty much takes us a couple of minutes. Any, one, one last one. Um, the selection process, so each of the five stages, um, sort of how long are each stage? Is it sort of 10 minutes or is it on a carousel? Um, yeah, so we're eight, eight minutes. Eight minutes, eight minutes per, um, per, per station. Yeah, eight minutes per station. Um, and they're exactly the same. I could probably squeeze in one more question. Um, they're exactly the same. Eight minutes, eight minutes per station. Yeah, fire away. Uh, what, sort of, what sort of intercalation degrees can you do and what's the benefit for them? There's an intercalation fair. Um, you have medical and non-medical um, intercalation, so you can do something in law or ethics. Um, I don't know beyond that. But um, in terms of the intercalation fair, it's basically all the all the different uh, places that you can apply to. Um, they're in stalls and you just go around and basically you can listen on the day, let, reflect on it and then go and apply for what you're interested in. And if there's something that's not at Manchester but is elsewhere, you're able to integrate out if you want to. I hope that helps. It's also different levels as well. So yeah. you can do BSc, MSc, MRes if you're more research based or you can do PhD like some people. Um, yeah, so it's, it's up to you, really. Um, there is a massive, massive range of them as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that a few years ago, intercalating used to give you an advantage in your foundation application. It doesn't now because of the this, way they've changed the, yeah, the system. Yeah. Um, so I'd say the main reasons to intercalate would be if you want a break, because you know, it's a long, long programme and you might want a break somewhere in the middle, and, and get an extra degree, it means you can get another degree in a year. Um, and there's lots of different, lots of different programs, some sciencey, some not sciencey, that you can take. Other people take an intercalated degree just because they enjoy it. Um, other people, um, and the dean being the primary exam, sorry, I keep coming back to this, um, has clearly decided that she wants an academic career in, um, in, in medicine and wants to do research alongside clinical work. So intercalating can really help. Um, in, um, in if you want a research career within medicine. Great. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. That's the, the time up. What I would say is um, that try and visit as many medical schools as you can. Some of them will feel right. They're the ones to apply to. And, and good luck, really. And thanks to our students for, for helping out today. So, <laughs> right.